So everybody, thank you for joining us at the Link Conference. Um, as you can no doubt tell, my name is Jason Collier, and this is Jared Gradle. We are PowerPoint engineers, total experts with the product there. Um, so we're here to talk today about archiving with uh, Link Server 2013. So hopefully nobody stands up, leaves the room, and says, I'm in the wrong room. So about myself, and we'll pick things up. We're a few minutes behind, so I know we're all wanting to get to the next sessions and have a good time. Um, I'm based out of Seattle, um, very calm, quiet, don't laugh, don't chuckle much. Um, so we have interesting personalities. Um, so I'm based out of Seattle. Um, if you've looked at the rollout adoption success kit or the IP workload poster, um, I've worked on some of those things. I've recognized a few faces on some of the trainings I've delivered across um, the coast. I'd say my primary customer base is public sector and out of Seattle generally. Um, so I have a lot of interesting perspectives on that. Um, prior to joining Microsoft, I spent 15 years in the financial industry. So a lot of my experience comes from, you know, working at banks with 50, 100, 150, 200,000, you know, IM users, whether it was LCS, OCS, Link. So um, that's a little bit about me. My partner in crime, Jared. <laughs> All right, my name is Jared Gradle. Uh, I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. I'm a dedicated PFE also. Um, I've worked with customers from banking to IT to various other industries. Um, I authored a couple of chapters in the resource kit. I've written a couple of blog entries. Most of the time, they try and make them useful. Um, that's about it. It is. Nobody caught the sunny demeanor? Did anybody? Because there was prizes. There are no prizes. There, there are prizes. So who got it? Two in the back? All right, remind me. <laughs> Skype bucks. Oh, we are giving out prizes, and there will be ch ch challenges, questions, quizzes. So. Um, so why is everybody in here? You're here for the Jared and Jason show? No. Um, so we're here to talk about archiving. And you know, let's call it as it is. It's not the sexiest feature the product has, right? It's not something you can go to the CIO and say, I can archive. And they're like, who? I have a bad idea. Paul, right? Paul, you're getting a promotion. You've got archiving. No, HD video, mobile, stuff like that is the sexy features that we can sell. But for a lot of organizations, archiving is what's critical to the foundation. It's kind of the behind the scenes. If it's not archived, you can't do it, right? We're the unsung heroes that have to worry about that. So we'll talk about that. I'll lose it if you hand it to me. Um, so we'll understand new features, capabilities. We'll talk about that. Anybody in here have 2013 deployed yet? Ooh, awesome. Um, so anybody with persistent chat? Anybody still have group chat? Anybody know Parlano Mindalign? That's, that would go way back in the financial industry. Um, so first challenge for a Skype card we'll have is to talk about find the duplicated slide in here. So Jared and I have spent hours looking for it. We haven't been able to find it yet, but we know it's duplicated because the guy told us and he wouldn't tell us which one. So, so we'll talk about archiving and why do we archive. Um, the honest answer is I probably couldn't put enough slides up here to explain why each and every organization in this room archives. Um, it's you know, maybe appropriate use policy. You have to worry about what's being said internally. Um, are staff talking about inappropriate things? Um, you know, human resource complaints, you know, Jared's always sending me funny jokes or he's talking about, you know, how he makes better beer than anybody else, things like that. So it might be company policies and procedures or it's required by policy, laws, and oversights. Um, everybody's seen the commercial, I'm not a lawyer, but I stayed in a Holiday Inn Express. Well, the good thing is Jason and Jared are not going to interpret the laws for you and what's you know, and I'll coin you a Seattle word, what's wonky is one bank will interpret a law differently than another bank. So we're going to stay away from that because that is a recipe for disaster. Um, but, you know, maybe be, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, SEC, NASD requirements, things like that. You want to take 2010? Sure. Archiving with 2010, what happened is we leveraged MSMQ, so data was picked up out of the SIP messages. It was written to MSMQ. MSMQ forwarded it to the archiving server. The archiving server wrote it into SQL. It worked 
pretty well most of the time. No, I'm sorry. It worked well 99% of the time. Occasionally, you'd run into issues with MSMQ. Um, either it wasn't properly joined to Active Directory and would have issues, or it, was, uh, it would fill up. So what happened is, with 2013, MSMQ was deprecated, and we rely on link the 2013 OISS, as I explain ahead too many slides. Uh, so with link 2013, the archiving service is enabled, well, installed on each server. And we leverage other underlying components of link 2013 to make this happen without having to use MSMQ. Which is a good thing, because as Jared yes. mentioned, you know, MSMQ worked, but when it didn't work, it was problematic, right? You know, you might have those queues fill up and it brings the link pool down, and then whose fault is it, right? It's everybody in the room's fault, not MSMQ, so. Yeah, and MSMQ is also a rather old component that was in Windows. Um, so there are a number of reasons, right? There's a lot of advantages to move to Link 2013. Well, with Link 2013 and, and moving off of MSMQ, there are a lot of advantages to it. Um, we also added exchange integration, and what that does is instead of archiving to a separate SQL instance or a SQL instance that you have other databases on, you can archive straight into Exchange and let the Exchange administrators manage the archiving policy for a particular mailbox. So you sort of have one point to go to to control your archiving as opposed to having two separate archiving information stores. The, the other thing we did was with 2013, we introduced SQL mirroring. And there was a lot of feedback from the community saying, we want SQL always on, right? So um, you'll see us here in an updated slide. Um, I think we got it a little highlighted. We announced here now that we do support always on with, uh, SQL, with Link Server 2013. So when you see these slides, we do support that as well for archiving. Um, so just leveraging either SQL or Exchange is our two options. Do you mean clustering or always on? Uh, we support mirroring, clustering, and always on. So essentially everything that's supported with the Link 2013, right? So SQL mirroring was added in Link 2013, something that wasn't supported in Link 2010. So since we're leveraging the Link 2013 underlying file sharing infrastructure, right, which is LYSS, which we'll get into in one of the later slides, we can support everything that Link supports as a back end. So any of the SQL options, right? SQL mirroring, always on, SQL clustering, et cetera. Um, another huge benefit of going to 2013 for the archiving store is there is a very rich ecosystem for e-discovery, et cetera, with Exchange 2013 that isn't there with Link because it's not as mature of a product in terms of archiving and data recovery, right? This is a, e-discovery has been an email and there's a lot of tools for it. it, it and something I always struggled with with my jobs was you would meet compliance officers and they would say, well, we understand email, but we're not really sure how chat works. And they would always try to reevaluate it, right? And you couldn't just, just say, tell them, it's just email. Because that's really all it is, but it's just a different vessel. So we struggled with that, I think, as um, you know, Jared points out, as maturity. So you really have two options when you're deploying Link 2013. Previously, all the way back to the OCS, LCS days, it was always just SQL. So like Jared said, now we've introduced the option of archiving to Exchange. Um, it does require Exchange 2013. So if you're running Exchange 2010, you know, time to upgrade. Hopefully you're not the Exchange and Link guy or gal, because then you're pretty busy. So um, what's cool about this, as Jared says, it's got a mature ecosystem. Um, we can leverage the archiving directly into, share, into Exchange. SharePoint has their discovery center, so you can go do searches against the data that's stored in Exchange. You can search from it from the Exchange control panel, um, all sorts of things.
So if we're archiving to Exchange and we're saying we're archiving to Exchange, we don't care what your link archive option is. So we'll show that up on the slides and we'll show you some of the PowerShell commandlets. And I think I borrowed without permission from somebody's work, some of their commandlets to look at both the Exchange and Link mailboxes. <coughs> so he may be shocked when he sees some of this code in here, so. Um, nobody? That's the duplicated slide. <laughs> so, go ahead. Uh, all right, so what's archived? Peer-to-peer -peer IM conversations, multi-party IM conversations, conference content, including updated content, polls, and whiteboards. Um, we don't archive peer-to-peer -peer file transfers because that's a peer-to-peer -peer file transfer and it doesn't go through the database. Um, and obviously for some of the live stuff, right, audio, video, et cetera, there's not really a good way to, to archive that. Uh, something that's important with this on the multi-party IM conversations, the you have to be careful in how you're archiving pools. If you have a multi-pool scenario and you have archiving on pool A but not on pool B, you may not catch all of that conversation because the conversation sits across multiple pools. So you need to be conscientious that if you're going to archive and want to archive everything, you need to have archiving on everywhere. Yeah, we do have a link here to Partner Solutions. Can't stress enough. Um, you know, leverage partners for outside or peripheral needs, you know. Anybody here from the UK, EMEA? So they've got some pretty stringent requirements around audio and video conferences, and just frankly, that's not where Link is. And so they have to look at partner solutions. Um, we'll talk about uh, some of the partners that are here at the conference, some of the tools that are available, and some of the free tools. Something else to point out with archiving is it does not provide ethical firewalls. So if you're in a scenario where you can't have person A talk to person B or you know entity A within a company talk to entity B, archiving doesn't cover that. And once again, you have to leverage a third party product to do that. So this is kind of a geeky slide. So hopefully, um, you know, the one thing I would say with the 400 level session like this is when you are in here, if you don't understand something, that's always a good thing, right? It means the material is deep enough. You can go back, you can leverage this. I'd keep this slide around because if you've ever called support and you're troubleshooting something, you're gonna hear them talk about link storage service or LYSS um, or Liz, which gets confused with the other lists within link. Um, but link storage service is what runs on top of Windows Fabric or Win Fabric, um, which is the magic that is brought to life in link 2013 for data replication. Really the big thing you're looking at here almost fell. Um, the big thing you're looking at right here is we used to write only to SQL data. Now we have basically an adapter. So in the code level, we can say I'm sending chats to SQL or I'm sending them to Exchange. Everything else is transparent to the APIs, to the ecosystem. You know, there could be adapters for other things in the future if there were needs, demands, things like that. Um, so it's very cool how that storage service works. Each of these APIs, each of these modalities here on this slide all have performance monitor counters you can watch for read writes, failures, success, things like that. Hey, and look, I took your next slide. Sweet. That means I don't have to talk about it. Uh, if any of you are, I don't know if, if Fabric has been covered in any of the sessions that you've attended, um, but a brief primer on it is Fabric is a, uh, new component of Windows and we leverage, Link leverages Fabric to maintain continuity between the servers and a Link pool. It's how we provide the updated resiliency options in Link 2013 is you have Fabric and then LYSS sits on top of Fabric and between the two of them it provides the high availability, it provides the redundancy, the data is synchronized across the servers. Um, which is why you need either one server or three server in a pool. So one server is always a master server. And if you have two servers, you can't have a master server. So you have three servers and away you go. So um, on that note, this is hugely important and Jared and Jason are gonna give away free consulting later. If you have a two front end pool, talk to us don't afterwards. Do don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And I will, take these and tear them up if you do them. But don't do it, talk to us afterwards. If you're in that situation, we can give you plenty of info on why not to do it. Um, but the good thing about Fabric, 
and I'll hit this briefly, um, the biggest concern we have in the compliance industry or archiving is data loss, right? Um, anybody here have access to a data center? So anybody here think I'm not clumsy? I've almost fallen three times on this cable. So you can imagine me That's in a data center. That's taped to the floor. That is taped to the floor with like six layers of duct tape. So I'm in the data center, right? Worst thing ever. Jared's chatting. He's having a conversation on his front end. I walk by and I kick the power cord. Fabric has replicated it to the two secondary servers and protected that data. So that's the huge value that Fabric and Link Storage Service brings to 2013. It's that preservation of the data. It's the, honestly, the, the keep my job feature. So. And if you let me in your data center, it's a hugely bad idea. And I have no idea what just happened there. So uh, delegation of archiving and administration. Um, so we brought into the product role-based access control early on in the product, kind of the granular features. You know, I may give Alan access to only what Alan needs and Peyton access to only what Peyton needs. Now, why do I do that? Most outages that we see, probably 80% of outages are accidents. Somebody had too much permissions, and they went in, and they were looking in Topology Builder, and they're like, survivable branch appliances. I don't work with those. I don't want to see them here. Right-click, delete. So we can delegate the administration of this. You may have folks that are only responsible for archiving, so you'd put them in the CS archiving role, um, which is obviously that Active Directory group. Or better yet, if you have an exchange administrator and he's in charge of archiving, you can delegate that to him, and all he can do is mess with archiving, and away you go, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. And you can call him the exchange and link archiving administrator. Um, so we're going to talk about archiving with SQL. I'm going to take that one, and then I'm going to let Jared talk about exchange, um, just because he always chuckles when I work on exchange and grimaces. So it always works out well. It's good for free beer. It is good for free beer. So I always reward the thanks. I'm like, hey, Jared, a case of what are you wanting today? Um, so with Link Server 2013, we've said the archiving server role has been deprecated. That's a hugely good thing. You know, MSMQ was great. It was an older technology. When it worked, it rocked. When it didn't, it was painful. Um, so the product group did some great stuff. They said, you know what, let's replace that with a more reliable, faster mechanism. We have something called UDC agents or Unified Data Collection agents. They sit on every front end server you have, and they automatically capture that data. Um, so you can see the front end server is the left box. Um, and we have the link storage service, which is writing to that SQL instance. Um, the archiving agent, obviously, is only one process running on that box, takes care of everything we need to do. As we mentioned, out of the gates, we only supported SQL mirroring. Then we brought SQL clustering to the table. And then now we support SQL always on. Um, so we're kind of transparent to what the R SQL method is on the background. So the archiving agents, um, they're known as unified data collection agents. They're installed and activated automatically. Um, they actually capture the IMs without archiving enabled regardless. Once they get them into the queue, then they evaluate whether archiving is enabled, which is a good thing. So instead of programmatically, every time John sends a mail, or an IM, I did it. Every time John sends an IM, I don't evaluate, hey, am I enabled for archiving? Am I enabled? We Capture it, then we look and we say, oh, okay, we're enabled, let's archive it. If not, we discard it. So programming choice for the uh, devs in here that we did to optimize. We have our two options for archiving, uh, whether it's SQL or Exchange, and I'll let Jared talk about Exchange. Um, we do need file shares, and we do need that. It's regard required regardless of um, whether or not we use SQL or Exchange for archiving. So what do we do? We use the file share for. I'm not even going to be able to give them out. OK. So conferencing data. So as we upload content to the conference, it goes to the file share. Uh, yes, that's cheating. Unrelated to this topic. Um, so yes, your content goes up on the file share. We do have tools you can use to view the file share, so we'll talk about that in a bit. The other thing we've changed is, anybody remember OCS 2007? We wanted a SQL server for this, a SQL server for that. And you would say to us, Jared, can I co-locate these databases? And he would go. So we have a better story on co-location, right? 
So now we can co-locate on a single SQL instance. Um, keep in mind, if you're not the SQL DBA, you probably want to let them know that archive databases get large, large. So each SQL instance can only have one backend database, one monitoring database, and one archiving database. Um, common question we get, can I rename the LCS log database? No. Hard-coded, not going to change. Um, so my PowerPoint modifications to this slide deck was this little line through right there. It took a lot of Bing and Googling to figure out how to do, so please appreciate that. So supported versions of SQL, um, SQL 2008 R2 or higher. The big thing you want to notice here is SQL Express is not supported. So for the smaller organizations that have standard edition, what does that use? SQL Express. So we have to look at a separate SQL server. So three simple steps to archive with SQL. We go into the topology builder, and we define a new SQL store. So these screen caps, um, Jared and I got kind of smart, so you got to make sure you note that down on our reviews. Um, when we took these screen caps, we took them from something called the test drive VM set. Has anybody heard of this? Only one? So test drive VM set. Complete downloadable VMs with Exchange 2013, Link 2013, SQL, monitoring, monitoring reports, and SCOM. Download it free. Persistent chat's in there. You can rock and roll. You got your whole setup. So we define SQL. Remember, we support SQL mirroring right here. Then we associate the pool. So I'm saying I'm associating it with the SQL store. Remember, there's no archiving server that we're uh, associating with anymore. And then the third step is we say archiving policies. So I can say I want to archive internal communications only. So this is, you know, Alan and I chatting about the great new feature that's in his slide deck. Or external communications. I'm chatting with, you know, a provider um, out there. I'm going through the edge, so I can say I only want to archive internal, external, or both. I have three different options for selecting a global arch or archiving policies. Um, I can say I want to archive at the global level. So in this scenario, I'm archiving both internal and external conversations. And then anybody that's a member of the link site, so I'm saying that site only is being archived for internal. Now I'm the link admin, so guess what? I don't want to be archived. So I've got a little user policy that says Jason is not archived. It was a good idea. No, they are archived. Yep. But what happens is my conversations, so put it in a bigger scenario. You're archived. You bring everybody in this room to your conversation and they're not archived, the conversation's going to be archived. Because the way it's viewed as is you have the requirement to be archived. So. You got a question? He's going to get two Skype cards. So the question is, if you're set up in a hybrid scenario, so you're split between link on-prem and link online, that's going to get two Skype cards. I'm going to take that one offline just because I've got to ask a guy. So that actually depends. It depends on if you're online multi-tenant or online oh, dedicated, yeah, 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 right? So it's, w yeah. there's a slide that covers it. I bugged one of the Office 365 guys to give me an answer because it's different, right? You don't, you don't. Hardly anybody's dedicated. I mean, it's a very limited few dedicated. Don't tell the dedicated guys that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so if if you're in a multi-tenant pool, it's archived to Exchange 2013, and away you go. Exchange 2013, e-discovery, you're done. So the other thing to look at, and the, the struggle I have is with the control panel, I struggle occasionally, is some of the navigation to me doesn't flow. Keep in mind, the least frequently items are used from the right and the most frequently to the left. So think of it as I configure archiving once, I may create a couple policies twice, 
and then I work my way in. So that always helps me with this. But here's where we set up the archiving configurations. Um, we have global site and pool level. And under the archive settings, we can say I want to disable archiving. So this is I don't want to, dis I don't want to archive anything. I want to archive IM sessions, or I want to archive IM and web conferencing sessions. Can anybody, I was trying to use the pointer on the mouse. Um, can anybody tell me what block IM or web conferencing sessions if archiving fails? Why would I do that? He had his hand up, so he's going to get the card. Right, but why? He's going to have it. So, so tell us while we're, if I paper cut them, it's going to be a lawsuit. It's plastic. So why do, why do I want to, why do I want to? Yep. So I worked at a very, very, very large bank in North Carolina. And we said we would rather shut down IM for 200,000 users than not capture one IM. Because that one IM is expensive. It could be $4 million, $10 million, $20 million IM. So with 20, 2010, we used to shut the whole pool down. It was really cool, right? We would just stop everything. It was like the air brakes in a truck. We're like, mm. So now what we do is we actually only block IM for users that are enabled for archiving. That's pretty sexy, right? So back to that scenario, we had 80,000 people in a pool. Five people might have been archived. We impacted all 79,000 of them. So a very sexy little feature we did. Um, I am failing would probably be the link storage service or fabric is having issues. Um, so if this happens to you, that's where you're going to look. Um, conferencing is a little bit easier to invoke a failure. And I have a customer that does this pretty regularly. So to get conferencing to fail, have your file share unavailable. So they're a big fan of rebooting the file share in the middle of the day. Yeah, it's just patching it, right? Nothing uses it. Link will catch up. Oh, no, no. So enable purging of archiving data. This can be a dramatic one for your company. You may have to archive for 365 days. You might only do 21. Doesn't matter. So this option to purge data is only impactful to SQL. If you put data in exchange, which Jared's going to talk about next, Link's not going to purge it. It's not going to do data management on it. It's not going to do any mailbox retention. So that's external to that. The other option we have is this purge exported archiving data only. So I work at a bank. I want to put my chats in a third party tool. Maybe it's somebody that's got a compliance store out there. I have an export running, then I purge it. If it doesn't get exported, I don't want to purge it from the database. There is, and we'll talk about that. You see me fight it? I was like, <laughs> I'm going to turn it off now. Yeah, I'm going to turn it off, and then I'll just answer. All right, so with Exchange 2013, um, you have to have all of your standard worlds. I'm not sure why you put this light in. Because, uh, let's see, where was I? So you need Exchange 2013, right? We'll leave it at that. <laughs> We use OAuth to integrate with Exchange 2013. And this is actually a new feature to Link 2013. It also integrates with SharePoint 2013. And it is a server-to-server -server based mechanism. It's a server-to-server -server based token exchange for authentication. It's probably the simplest way to put it. So you set up your OAuth certificate, away you go. And this works for on-premise, cloud, and hybrid, which is really why it's there. So how do we integrate with Exchange? You have to have your OAuth, and then you set up permissions for it with the CS partner application. So you identify it as, hey, this is my partner application. I'm going to send my data there. Away you go. So what's the best way to explain this? With Link and archiving to Exchange 2013, once the data makes it to Exchange 2013, Link divorces itself and doesn't care what happens, right? 
it's like with link going to archiving to an archiving database, you have all of those purge and management options. When link archives the data to, ex to Exchange 2013, Exchange is responsible for it. So whatever mailbox policies you have that are user-based for your Exchange 2013 users, those will apply to the archiving data. The link settings no longer have any effect once the data has been delivered, right? So the point of this is we hand the data off to Exchange and we're done with it. And away you go. Uh, so to enable it with Exchange. It does, except for this little checkbox right here that says Exchange Integration. <laughs> I gotta show my public school math. Two steps to archive, and there's three. Come on, who was gonna call that? <laughs> well, the third step is optional. Uh, yeah, see, right. <laughs> I told you so. It's the boringest session you guys have had all week, right? Uh, yeah, so enable it with Exchange. After you've added the application, you click the checkbox, away you go. And the big thing here is the purging checkbox is still there, but it's not gonna touch the data. Right. They should probably gray that out if you they check should. the other one, but. They, they should make us <laughs> No. Uh, so you set your archiving configuration. So you figure out, you know, am I gonna archive IMs? Am I gonna archive web conferencing, et cetera, and you have the option to be fairly granular in how you want it to archive, right? To where does your data go? So you could do a global policy to archive IM to Exchange, and then you could override that with a site policy to archive site-based stuff to a local site that had link, depending on what the requirements are for your company or where you're at an Exchange 2013 rollout. You know, if you don't have Exchange 2013 rollout everywhere, you can have a policy that follows your rollout. What's that last setting? You're setting it to Exchange, but nothing will be like that. So right, so because you, you have it enabled to archive to Exchange, but you set it to not actually archive anything, so you could globally have a policy that enables archiving and then go find a particular user to enable archiving on because they're doing something they shouldn't be doing and somebody complained. Yeah, mostly when they put on the enable, they just say, oh, no, that's actually wrong. Well, so yes and no. So you'd have to enable a policy and link to send the data to Exchange right. for legal hold to apply to that user. So you haven't turned the knob on to enable archiving, right? So Jared's your exchange guy. He's just built this rock star exchange environment. You've set up this commandlet. You've got it configured to archive to exchange, but you haven't turned the knob on. Boss comes in and says, Jared did a good job. Let's turn it on. Boom, flip the bit. Yes, this is a great they segue do, to the next but slide. But you have to enable archiving on link for the IMs to get there to be placed on legal hold and be saved. So this is more the infrastructure, and look at that segue. Now <laughs> how to get to the users. We're out of Skype cards for him. Uh, there's two right there. Well, that's for him. Oh, okay. Public school math again. Um, so uh, let's see. Where am I? So this is pretty self-explanatory, right? It covers, these are, you have your, the previous slide covered global settings, this slide covers individual settings. So you can individually set 
a particular user to have their IMs archived. What I like about this is kind of how Jared was talking about passing the buck, right? So this uninitialized, what you basically are saying is everybody in here, I'm going to almost, I'll make the bet. This is Vegas, right? We all make dumb bets. Um, apparently, it doesn't always land on black 17, as I learned. Um, but uninitialized means Allen goes on legal hold, it automatically goes in effect. That's not something the link guy has to worry about. You know, the exchange person already has that whole process for legal hold. So we just become out of the picture. We're just a provider. We don't have to worry about it. Let's absorb those exchange policies. Um, I think uninitialized is probably the sexiest feature out there because, again, it's NMP, not my problem, right? That exchange process already exists. Legal hold process already exists. Well, and the advantage to that is once you set it to be uninitialized, you don't have to go change it in two different applications, right? You make... Right. Correct. Right. So you we'll, enable it, we ship the data over there. Just like when you enable it in in Link, we ship the data to SQL. Same concept. It's enabled. Away it goes. And then we'll talk about where does your data actually go, because um, this gets a little bit interesting, right? So Link places the data in the purges folder, which is under the recoverable items folder. It is not a folder that is readily available to the user unless they use a tool or tools to go look at it, right? So it's a non-IPM folder, meaning that you're not going to see it in OWA and you're not going to see it in Outlook. And the interesting thing about the purges folder is that everything under the recoverable items folder applies, well, legal hold applies to it, or there's a separate set of policies within Exchange to manage it. So if you have a mailbox policy and you purge your data after 60 or, you know, you purge email out of the mailbox after 60, 90, 120 a year, et cetera, this will not apply to that, right? Because it takes place outside of that recoverable item. So if a user, um, you know, goes in and makes a change or you have your recoverable items policy set to retain data for 21 days, but you have the mailbox set to retain data for a year, you'll only retain IM conversations for 21 days because the mailbox policy applies to the mailbox and not to the recoverable items folder, et cetera, which is also where your deleted items go and things like that. Does that make sense? No. I believe the recoverable items do not apply to mailbox quota because mailbox quota is geared toward the user and geared toward what's in their inbox calendar, et cetera. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yes. Right. And disk consumption, right? You know, so your exchange storage platform, you know, you're in a perfect world, you're going to let the exchange admin know, hey, we're going to do this, and there's going to be a lot of data coming your way. You're not going to surprise them, and then all of a sudden, you know, a few terabytes later, they're so just made. But that's. I never agree if you tell full disclosure, so it's better to just say, let's do this OAuth handshake. <laughs> right. I'd and then it's an exchange off. problem. I will have to follow up on that. I don't know offhand. Yeah, I, I think the answer is no. Yeah, I think the answer is no. Um, I think your way would be to use SQL as your archive and then use some of the export commandlets and then email file. Yeah, nothing pretty. So. Correct. But you could put a bow on it and you could make it look. <laughs> um, so, sorry. Uh, this is how you would enable an individual user for Exchange. Um, you create an Exchange archiving policy and 
you archive it to Exchange and you run it through PowerShell and send it on its way. Yes? Because when you dump it to Exchange, you can apply all of the e-discovery tools that are available to Exchange to that data, right? Yeah. Like, Link has no concept of legal hold, which has been around in the Exchange world for, I think, since 2010. And legal hold is, hey, you have a user who, you know, he's doing something he shouldn't, or you need to archive their email. So you place them on legal hold, and it will, it will archive everything that user does, all the data within their mailbox, until they're taken off legal hold, right? So they can't, you know, shift delete something and force delete it, right? It gets, it gets archived, period. And by dumping this to legal hold, you know, to exchange, you have all those tool sets that are in exchange, right? The native ones, third party ones, SharePoint search, you know, there's, a, there's just a much richer ecosystem of tools to deal with it. And you know, on the link side, when you archive to SQL and link, the user doesn't have access to that data. Right? That data is only accessible by an administrator. So really where this feature came about was from customers. They wanted more from archiving. And the product group had to evaluate, how do we build all of that functionality we have in Exchange into link? And somebody said, well, that's kind of goofy, right? Why would we pull all that functionality and duplicate it? Why not just leverage, which has got a mature life cycle behind it? It already has partners. You know, you may work at an organization that's already got tools that are monitoring journal mailboxes and doing this and doing that. And, you know, so that's the path we took was Exchange has got it down. Why not leverage, you know, a proven track record? You know, especially with Exchange Online and some of the stuff. Um, and honestly, we've never done a great job with tool sets from Microsoft to pull archiving data, right? We it's have, either go write your own SQL queries, or there's a tool to dump it to EML, to, to EML files. There's not the ecosystem that's available in Exchange. Yep. And there's some third-party vendors that have written tool sets that are really good and do a good job. Um, but for us, it was easier to port this to Exchange and have one place to manage it. Yep. And you bring up some good topics, Jared. What about with Office 365, since we just talked Exchange Online? <laughs> there you go. So Office 365 Online multi, well, multi-tenant, um, as we touched on. The multi-tenant, it gets archived to Exchange 2013, period. End of discussion. There's not an option to archive it to SQL. Um, it gets archived to 2013. and Away you go. And the real value here, or the real reason behind that, is you can imagine um, one SQL database would contain entities from all different organizations, where if we put it in your mailbox, it's your mailbox, it's your data, it's your entity, or your endpoint. Um, and then again, the same thing. We had Exchange Online doing this. We had to look at how do we do it for Link Online, why recreate the wheel. Let's leverage a known, proven vessel for that. So um, the, the key thing to note on this is the last point. You know, you don't have direct control of archiving from the link admin console, you know, other than to enable or disable a particular user. Um, if, and archiving is only available if you have Exchange Online or if you're in a hybrid deployment. So obviously no Exchange, no archiving. So. Yes. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> right. Um, so the short answer is I have a customer starting this endeavor next week. So, um, so I will, you'll have an answer in two weeks because he'll have told the customer no, that doesn't work. Yeah. No. I'll say, <laughs> let me get back to you and I'll get you a Skype card. Nope, government customer. Um, so after the session, come up. And now you guys all know this, right? Come grab us. Get our email addresses. Grab a business card. 
follow up with us. Um, both Jared and I are dedicated, so that means we do travel some. We do have dedicated customers. If you don't get a response, fire off another email. And one of us likes beer. That's him. You can tell. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so link online dedicated archives to SQL. You cannot archive to Exchange 2013 um, for those who use link online dedicated. And what happens is, this is kind of an interesting process, but the archiving databases get purged. So you get a 60-day read-only copy of the database. So you have 60 days worth of data retention. And you can suck that data out of the 60-day database into your own database for data warehousing. Um, there's support standard ODBC connectivity for tools. So you have the option to write something, and away you go. So there's a lot of options that, um, as you guys all know, um, Big Fin, oops. So the link control panel web interface is basically a rider on top of PowerShell, right? So anytime you click a button in the link or control panel, that's executing a PowerShell commandlet on the back end. Now, there are a few options that are not available in the control panel that are only accessible in the link management shell. Um, purge hour of day. Um, this is an important one. So this is the hour of the day that the messages are purged from the database. So 2 a.m. every morning, it's going to purge according to your purge policy. Um, I'll, I'll say this, kid gloves with this. Um, when I was a customer, when I was a customer and I would call people at Microsoft for support, um, we kept about a year, you know, three years of archive data. And then we made the decision to only keep 14. So we turned this on. And then at 1 a.m. it started purging. And I thought it would finish fairly quickly. It took about three months to finish cleaning it up um, because it would just lock the database. And every morning at 1 a.m. Jason worked from 1 till 5. At 5 a.m. I stopped it, went back to bed, and then got to work at 9. Um, so the enable purging time is a very important value to watch. Um, the archive duplicate messages. So um, this is what I call our cross-pool challenge. Jared's on pool one. I'm on pool two. Pool two has archiving enabled. Jared's having the conversation and then brings me in. Portions of the conversation are missed. So we highly encourage you to do um, the uh, archive duplicate, or as this says, archive V, duplicate messages. Uh, make sure you spell it right when you do your PowerShell commandlets. Yes, it will, it will tell you otherwise. It will say, where did you learn to spell from Jason? And then, um, yes, so the example is that um, Jared has an account in pool one. I'm in pool two. Um, I send a reply to an instant message that Jared has initiated. His pool doesn't have archiving enabled. Sorry, let me restate it. Jared's pool does have archiving enabled. Mine does not. So what we're telling you to do is enable archiving on both pools, set this bit to archive duplicate messages, and then what happens is we're going to capture that first message that Jared sent from his pool as well as my pool, even though Jared's only one archived. So it helps you not miss the conversation where you run into a scenario where half the conversation or the first line of a conversation is missed. Ah, okay, so you have the data at rest issue. No, the, the, I'm, I'm going to get it there. Right, it has to be captured, maintained in the country of origin, or not captured at all. Yes. 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 There's no way... Yes. I mean, and it doesn't really make sense to archive you having a conversation to yourself. Well, it would be interesting. It's like many of mine. And, and that would be okay. But we want to maintain the conversation with anybody else. Yes, yeah, so in that scenario, I would say you never, ever, ever archive a conversation if there's somebody from Germany in it. According to your lawyers and what your legality says. 
that would I let's talk offline. offline yeah, so I mean, I, I would. We talk have third-party tools for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I would talk to some of the compliance vendors. There's some in here, you know, that that I would recommend. I would encourage. Do you like that? I step back. I recommend. So cache purging interval. So remember what I said is we archive automatically or we capture automatically. We put it in this cache and we look at this data and then we say, oh look, Jared's archived. Oh look, Jared's archived. Let me grab from that cache. So the cache purging interval is how often we purge that interval. Um, the values are between 4 and 168. The default value is 24. Um, Jason's advice is usually don't change values unless you have a really, really good reason because there's a lot of testing that goes into the default values. Dancing outside of those boundaries um, sometimes can get you in trouble. So I went through these. I'm trying to catch us back up from our PowerPoint debacle, so I slammed the caffeine. We should be good. So value is military time. Default's 2 a.m. Um, archive duplicate messages. Your scenario is extreme. I would have to ponder that one for a while. Um, I do imagine around 11.30 tonight, I'm going to have a, an epiphany moment and go, aha. So, yes. I won't email you at 11.30 at night, though. Okay. Nothing good could come of that in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the cash per interval, again, this is a good thing. Um, we write all this information to the link storage service, and we're replicating it around. Um, anybody know the default file size for SQL Express or max file size? for that database? 10 gigs. Each front end gets about three gigabytes of data to use in that database, because remember, it's replicated from the master to two secondaries, about a gigabyte of overhead. So you have about three gigs of working space in that cache before um, you run into issues. So. Which is much better than MSMQ, which was a gig. Yeah, and MSMQ was a gig. You could pump it up to eight gigs, and you started having some fun issues, which is what I did as a customer. Which is why you don't mess with the default values. Yep, exactly. Uh, Jared used to tell me, Jason, the stove is hot. And I'd be like, okay. Hang up with Jared. Oh, God, he was right. Don't do that. Did you bring your demo laptop? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, so, archiving disclaimer. So, um, and it's not hidden, so we'll have to go. So, um, why would we want to send disclaimers to federated partners? Hey, buddy, my IM conversations are archived. Careful what you send me, right? Um, yours is a little more extreme, right? It, you, companies like the legality of saying, hey, these, this conversation's being recorded, John. Be careful what you say. Um, yeah, so this um, was a good example of Wells Fargo, right? So they have archiving enabled, so they send disclaimers in their conversations. And this is back to you might have, you might be legally required to display that. All right, so accessing the data, and we're almost caught back up on time. Uh, let's see. So with SQL, it's stored in LCS log. You can't change it, leave it alone. There's tools to, per, to, to pull data out. Um, the basic options are you can do it to a CSV, you can do it to uh, EMLs, which an EML is an Outlook mail message. So you, know, you say, hey, go, go give me everything that's in there for Jared, and you'll get a dump of email messages of all the conversations that I've had. And then you can manipulate those or do other things with them whatever floats your boat. Uh, the, and I can't stress this enough, the tools in Exchange are way better for doing e-discovery than they are in Link. So Exchange Storage, um, anybody remember this tool? Any Exchange admins in here? EWS editor for the win, woo -hoo. It's on CodePlex now, um, but this is where you can actually go. Um, this is not an end user tool, not an end user tool. This is Joe Link Admin and Joe Exchange Admin getting the system set up. And what's the first thing you do? You send a message, test, right? So this is the tool you're gonna use to open the user's mailbox. And Jared walked us through that. It's in the uh, mailbox recoverable items purges folder. And we can see all the messages that were sent with this tool. I can double click and view them. 
We'll skip this one too. So, yeah. So, persistent Your chat. Favorite topic. Uh, my favorite topic. So, I uh, used to have hair. Um, no, so I worked with MindAlign Parlano before it became group chat, you know, back when it was IRC based. So, I have a lot of experience with persistent chat. I love persistent chat. Um, so Jared always gives me a hard time about it because we pushed the boundaries at my last couple jobs with that. Um, so remember we talked about Windows Fabric, the magic of link, data resiliency, and everything. Forget about that for persistent chat, not used by persistent chat at all. So the limitations of the two front end servers in a link enterprise pool doesn't exist with persistent chat. So enabling compliance with group chat 2010, anybody ever done that before? It was a pain in the butt. You would pick one server, that would be your compliance server. If that server failed, guess what? Eh, no compliance. So it wasn't a great story. And you know what? Customers said, not a great story. So what did we do? We listened, we heard, and we fixed it. So now all we do is go into a persistent chat pool, and I lost the pointer again. We go into the persistent chat pool and we select a compliant SQL store and that determines where the messages are archived to. The compliance service is no longer standalone. Each persistent chat server is responsible for doing archiving of the chats it processes. So that means it's resilient, right? Persistent chat server fails, there's nothing for it to archive. The other servers pick up on it. Um, MSMQ is still a requirement. So that's a big gotcha that some customers run into is we tell you that MSMQ is not required on a link front end. Well, it kind of is if it's a persistent chat front end server. So when you set it up, you've got to pay attention to those. <laughs> so the other thing around persistent chat is there's what's called um, adapters. And the best thing I can say an adapter is more of, say, like a way of formatting these exports. Um, you may have an archive product from EMC, one from Actians, one from Ironport, one from, you know, all the different vendors out there. Each wants these XML formatted messages in their own format, right? So the, what is that thing? There's not one format to rule them all. So these adapters we have actually let you pick with the XML format that they're exported as. There's a lot of PowerShell commandlets here. Um, there's chat rooms. You can determine whether or not you want to export for a specific chat room, all chat rooms. Um, why would that be important? The gentleman in the blue, he may have a chat room that is for German tr uh, currency traders only. So he wants to export that to his EMC system in Germany. He wants to export the chat room that's for um, Denmark fixed income traders to a different compliance service. So he can, t and they may be two different products. So you can say which type of adapter you're using. Um, you, the other thing you can do, and we were a big fan of this at two of my jobs, was we liked to roll our own. So you can create a custom XML. You can customize and make your own format, put it in your own custom compliance repository. Um, things like that. How many pers how many people here use persistent chat, or are required? You're in banking or regulatory or something. You use it. Yep, it's big in the financial industry, right? Yeah. So um, the big use case, and I know I'm preaching to the three of you, was always like currency traders that were in the East Coast would chat all day. West Coast comes in, they can join the chat room and they can see the chats. Now it's funny, what they used to do was they would hold a squawk box call, only the, sorry, the squawk box is little speakers on your desk, push button to talk, but they'd hold a squawk box talk for an hour. Just dumbfounded me as a technologist that they would sit on the phone for an hour to talk about the last seven hours. And then when we put these chat rooms up, they were like, really, all I have to do is read this? That's so cool. And in the financial industry, this was hundreds of millions of dollars of profits off a chat room. So, come on, smile, it's exciting. It made me taller. <laughs> so, that is great feedback for that feature. And I would highly encourage you to come give me your name and information after this, and we can take that. 
So his comment is that we don't support federated persistent chat at this time. So notes from the field. Um, I'll let Jared start this one off. And we're caught back up. Are we? Good. Uh, so let's see. When you migrate your users, both data stores can be used. So you can archive to SQL, and you can enable Exchange integration and do both at the same time. So you can have your data in two places. Um, the big caveat with this is we don't want you to do it long term. So remember, you have an interesting dynamic. I was the customer. He was Microsoft. And Jerry would say, Jason, are you doing this long term? And I would say, no. So, um, <laughs> Eight years later. Eight years later. So uh, we don't want you to do this long term, but that we do understand that migrations, you know, who can deploy Exchange 2013 in three months, right? It's a right. hard deployment. So that's really the thing there that we're looking at. So you have the option to, you know, if you're archiving for compliancy reasons, you can stagger your Exchange rollout and stagger what you do with your link archiving as you go. So you can do one or the other. Uh, let's see. So this bullet point is about me. So I like that. Um, so you know, I did give that scenario. We archived to the LCS log database. And every day I would tell my boss, if we're going to purge, we got to start now. We got to start now, right? And do you guys ever have that argument where you're telling your boss, we got to do this, we got to do this, and then you eventually forget about it? And you're like, I got to remind him. It's about 13 months later. Um, so we decided to drop it down to 14 days. We ended up having to purge it into, or purge in chunks. And, and that was a very painful experience. Um, you know, I, it took months to get that database cleaned up in a supported manner. So, um, you know, when you start out your archiving project, make sure you know what you're going to do. You know, don't, because anybody who's ever done a pilot, it always becomes pilot production production, right? Usually in the same day. I got a pilot with 10 users. Okay, it's monitored. That's production. Let's go. So this last, this last bullet point on the SharePoint Discovery. So SharePoint Discovery Center is a SharePoint portal that allows you to search Exchange. And because it will reach in and pull that data out of the purchase folder within the mailbox or um, You'll, it, it, it'll pull the data out of the purchase folder and out of the conversation history folder, which is where the user can go to see what chats they've had. It will give you duplication. So I, I know one of the engineers up here logged a bug on this and was like, found a bug. And they came back and they're like, nope, that's the conversation history folder. Real quick on your retention point. Yes. Archiving to Exchange is your new friend. So there's not, you can't set an individual, a, a specific, well, I guess there's, there's two ways you could do this. You could, um, well, one, the archiving, the purchase time period applies to anything in the SQL database. You can't single out an individual user and say, we're going to archive JSON for 10 years and everybody else in the pool for two years. What you could do is set that two-year retention period and then do a PowerShell script or something that basically a job that ran and pulled that user's data out you know, every year or something of that nature and build an archive there that you could have searchable and then let the two-year purge take place. Um, or you dump it into Exchange and you put them on indefinite legal hold and their data is archived. Twenty thirteen, yeah. Yeah, there's a few there's a way you could skin that cat, but I wouldn't want to do it. You know, just like Jared's saying, you could mess with the purging what's been exported and then yeah. If I, mean, I was gonna do it with just link and do it out of SQL, I'd write something where, you know, a PowerShell script where I pulled those individuals data that individual's data out and archived it to a file share or somewhere else and then just let the the two year purge take place. Yep. Are you aware of anybody that's done anything like that? 
No. But the, the, um, the PowerShell commands are there to do the export, so it's fairly simple to toss it in a wrapper and put it in a job and away it goes. Yeah, and the other thing I would say is, you know, leverage partners. We're going to talk about partners here in a second. There's a lot of good partner solutions out there. Um, and I'm a fan of, you know, smaller partners where I can go and say, I have this niche need that can adopt that need to my business. So, you know, there's, there's partners of all size. So, um, This top bullet point is really important. You don't want to have your link server in the U.S. archiving to Exchange in the U.K., especially in a busy environment. Um, I don't know if you guys pull stats, but in a large environment, the number of IMs that people send is astounding. It really changes the way people communicate, and it will, you'll wear out a connection. It's pushed, so when you, uh, it's pushed through EWS. Yep. Yeah, so nice segue to the next bullet point. So since we're using Exchange Web Services, some of the transport configuration settings need to be aware, we need to be aware of. Um, if you start blocking file size and, you know, Alan's customer lets him put 500 meg file attachments up there, but you're not going to let Exchange ingest that, now you've got to make that decision of, well, I let my trader upload this to a meeting, but I'm not letting Exchange ingest that. Um, so those are other considerations we've, you know, kind of seen people need to make questions on. I missed the logo. Um, so we talked about links, strengths are reinforced by the partner ecosystem. Um, so, and I've worked with every one of these vendors at a customer site or my own. Um, so, you know, and they're all here at the conference, so that's, right there's a good sign. Um, so Audio Code's a great solution. They've got SmartTap out there to record audio calls. Um, so if you have audio recording requirements. Um, Actience, they're kind of, do you guys remember the company named FaceTime? So they used to be FaceTime before it became Apple. Um, Instant Technologies, they've got a pretty sexy archive viewer that God came around in the LCS 2005 days. Where remember the tabs in the link client, or the communicator client, where we used to be able to do tabbed XML. Yeah, so I'm geeking out. Um, and then MindLink software, they um, they used to be called Formicry, a UK company does persistent chat. They've got a little mobile client for persistent chat. Uh, but those are definitely the the partners that are out there. My stress to you is make sure they're a link partner with us, because you obviously want Microsoft support. What that means is we're going to help that partner if they have challenges and vice versa. Um, go ahead. What's the audio code solution? Is that a link partner solution for choosing the port? <laughs> it's for recording the audio conversation. So um, I do a lot of public sectors. So jails, you know, that call that your mom never wanted to get. Hey, this call is being recorded. Um, they can do that. So um, NICE is another audio recording solution, and they're kind of an industry so, which is, in, and, I, and I apologize, I think you sound like you're from the UK? No, Netherlands. Netherlands, okay, EMEA. So, right, so you guys now have audio recording requirements and video recording requirements, so Audio Codes and NICE, I think, are the two providers that are in that space. Um, the other thing we have, um, and this is one of our coworkers um, who's, how would you describe it? He's just wicked. He's wicked smart. So uh, this guy, kind of Doug Dietrich. So he's one of our peers. Um, he's got an archive viewer that he wrote, um, which allows you to basically deploy a monitoring reports looking UI that lets you view the LCS log. Um, and he has one for 2010. He's got one for 2013. Um, one of the best blogs we have out there. So as yeah, if you've not, his name's Doug Dietrich. If you've not heard of his blog, there is a wealth of link information on it. Um, the, the cool thing about his tool is you can plug it into SharePoint reporting services and then it's a... a SQL. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, SQL reporting services and then it's a SQL reporting services app that you can go and run and away you go. Yeah. So if you have a monitoring server deployed, you could load this alongside 
in the in that SQL reporting instance for your monitoring server, and you have something you can go pull archiving data with too. Yeah, and, and definitely, like Jared says, his blog I would say needs to be like the top three link blogs you use. Um, Next Hop and that are primarily my two sources of info for my customers. Um, so definitely recommend Doug's blog. And, and feel free to tell them, you know, leave a comment. Jason and Jared said stop by. The, the OCS IM Archive Viewer, I believe it queries SQL directly and lets you see, you know, sort of what's in the database. It doesn't export the data, correct? Correct. Um, and, and then the other thing we have now is we just released the Link 2013 Conferencing Viewer. So it's a client side, or a uh, command line tool that you can use to grab the data from the file share and put it into a viewable HTML page. Um, so we want you all to visit the Microsoft Pavilion. Has anybody been there yet? Anybody use the catapult? Okay, I'll give you better directions. There is a bar with free drinks next to the catapult. You cannot put the drinks in the catapult. And trust me, we tried this. It is not powerful enough to launch one of us. Um, so the Microsoft Pavilion, that is all Microsoft staff that are working there. They're all engineers, product managers, and developers. And they'll probably hate that I just told you all that. But no, they're all working down there. Go down with your tough questions, <coughs> totally unrelated to archiving, link room system, whatever. Um, some of the best of the best are down there. And did I mention free drinks? So the other big thing, everybody knows about the party tonight? At that name place, <laughs> at MGM Grand, make sure you have your wristband. Again, what are they going to have there? Yes. And uh, I would say hands-on labs is something to view. Um, you guys have already, obviously, already checked those out. Can you hit one more slide? I can. And then um, the most important thing is, do you guys like Jared and Jason? Kind of fun guys. We like our jobs. Please, please, please give session feedback. We need the feedback. We need to know that we have these people in the session. So that's how Jared and Jason um, stay busy, gamefully employed, able to buy him beer. Um, I make so, my own beer. Well, he makes his own beer. So if you have questions on how to make your own beer. Um, but no, please fill out the sessions uh, or session feedback. Give us feedback. Um, feel free to write it in there. Jason and Jared need to take a PowerPoint class. That's completely fair. And the, the other thing is what you want to know, right? It, was there something about archiving that we missed that we didn't catch? Is there a particular topic that you want to know more information about? Yeah. So definitely make sure it's just animating away on its own up here. Um, so uh, make sure you fill out those session evaluations. Um, we're tight on time, but we'll do question and answers. See, I can't see him shaking his head no, since the light is in my eyes. So he said yes. So anybody have questions? If you want, come up to the mic. If not, I'll repeat them. I'm fairly loud. Oh, we have a one minute for questions. OK, go. 60 seconds, go. We'll, we'll go over. <laughs> Hold on one second. No. So I will. So crap. So there is a session here. Brandon Bernier is delivering, and I am almost positive it's already happened. Which, if it didn't, please act surprised, shocked, and amazed, and go, Brandon, great info. So they're announcing support for SQL Always On here at the conference. The CU? That with the new CU coming out, okay. there will be there's a document that must be followed in order to do it, and then Topology Builder will be modified to support it easier. So there's a document you must follow. Go to the session, grab the recording. Um, I pause. Oh no no no! Jason's not answering that one. Coming um, soon in a CU to you. Coming soon. In other words, if I have to deploy it next week, that doesn't exist. So Correct. I would go to Brandon's session. SQL clustering, shared drive storage. It is what it is. 
Uh, no, in all seriousness, Brandon's session will have more information on it, and he may have uh, a timeline. Yeah. Um, or you'll be able to find out more information as to what the timeline is. We don't know. And don't have any control over when CUs actually get released or if they'd stick to their planned dates. So. Right. It, it, and, and it's, as Jared says, in all honesty, we don't get pulled in on those dates because they can slide forward, back, forward, or back. So it would be impossible for him or I to stay current. But I can tell you that that is their announcement at his session, which I'm hoping has not has already happened, and I haven't stolen his thunder. I think so. it was because he was wearing his lovely great Harvard <coughs> shirt yesterday. I, it had to be yesterday. So if not, my name is not Jason. Yeah, look for Brandon Bernier is his name, and look for his session. And I'm Jared, if uh, it comes up. And I'm Alan. And you're Alan. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Just to their user's mailbox. No, the. I'm not a hundred percent sure on the details of this because I tried not to do anything with the exchange. But no, the we archive to the purges folder within that user's mailbox, and I believe the archiving database in Exchange is just if you're going to archive that user's mail out of their regular inbox for them to go search or pull data, you know, for they can do data discovery on their own. The thing to think about to, to think about with this is the user can't discover the data that's archived. So yes, it's archived to that user's mailbox, but the user has no idea that it's there. So you No, the, no, the exchange archiving primarily applies to the mailbox. What applies to link archiving, link archiving within that mailbox is legal hold or retention settings around that recovered items folder. And it is somewhat confusing the way it's set up. Any other questions? Any, how, how does Jared make his own beer? Done. Done. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And the one takeaway, please fill out the session evals. And excellent marks would be highly appreciated. I've got Skype cards. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs>